Hey there. A few weeks ago, I took my first vacation in a really long time, and I think my favorite part of that entire vacation was reconnecting with the feeling of improvising in real time with another musician, particularly jazz. And then I got home, and I felt really ill, and I tested positive for COVID. High on the feeling of playing music with others while simultaneously being quarantined to my own home, I did what anybody else would have done. I gave my robotic piano a consciousness so it could play along with me. My piano, by the way, is a Yamaha Disclavier MX100A Make II from the mid-90s. It has a disc drive, it has MIDI in and out, and it has 81 different robotic solenoids, one for each hammer. And as a result, it uses more power than everything else in my entire recording studio combined. 99% of the time that I play this piano, I am just playing it like a regular old upright that probably costs 10% as much as this one does. But in this video, I intend to push this farther than any player piano has ever been pushed. I'm going to train a neural network in my own playing style, and with some luck, I will be able to perform with it in a way that feels natural and realistic. I don't think there's anybody on the planet who has not heard the term neural network a bunch of times, but what is it exactly? Well, the OG term of it refers to our own biological brains here and the trillions of neuronal connections within them that are constantly changing through neuroplasticity every single time that we learn from an experience or a decision, making us wiser and better at making future decisions. And now we did it on computers. Let's pretend for a moment that I was able to magically buy all of my subscribers dinner on every single Sunday in some giant cafeteria on the one contingency that everybody eats the exact same meal and portion size as everybody else but the group gets to decide it. I imagine that pepperoni pizza would be a popular option, and when we think of pepperoni pizza, we usually think of those giant triangular slices. So I would find this out just by hearing people shouting at the top of their lungs, two slices of pepperoni pizza. And I would hear that louder than any other option, so I would give you your two slices of pepperoni pizza. So the next week you return to the cafeteria and everybody has learned a few things about pepperoni pizza. Some people felt like two slices is not enough for them, some other people felt like it was too greasy, and some of my subscribers may have even spent some time in the bathroom. So now we have a whole lot of people screaming three slices of pepperoni pizza, and we have a whole lot of other people screaming cheeseburgers and fries and cheeseburgers and fries is the loudest, so I give you cheeseburgers and fries. By the way, in this metaphor, none of us age, and we do this week after week for millions, billions, maybe even trillions of years, and after an impossible amount of trial and error and natural selection through group thinking, this process allows us to know what the absolute best meal is for human beings within the demographic of my subscribers. And that was the whole point to begin with. I designed this expensive experiment to answer that question and solve that problem. What is the best meal was the input layer. My subscribers were the hidden layer and the output layer was some sort of combination of French toast and fried chicken or whatever y'all came up with in that time. And that, more or less, is how an RNN, or a recurrent neural network, works. Now something called reinforcement warning may come up later in this video, and that would be if I hired a world-famous chef to come into the cafeteria every now and then and be like, hey, you know, if you melt the cheese at 150 degrees Fahrenheit and put a pinch of garlic on it, it might taste a whole lot better than what you're doing now, and that would just kind of help the process along and make it a bit more efficient. Now back in reality, that hidden layer of neuronal connections is unfortunately not a bunch of human beings loudly advocating for their favorite meal. It is trillions upon trillions of ones and zeros, so many that you need a few of these to even run a program like this. And unfortunately, those ones and zeros don't speak English, which leads to the black box problem. One of Google's neural networks designed for health and medicine can predict an inpatient's chances of dying with an astonishing 95% accuracy. 
This would be the largest achievement in medicine in the last century if that neural network could provide any sort of meaningful information to prevent those deaths but it can't. The neurons in the hidden layer are communicating in ways that are much more efficient and fast than anything that us humans can even begin to fathom. It is a black box and we are locked out of it. And this has become such a big problem that arguably more recent research has been going into making AI more transparent and easy to interpret rather than advancing the power of AI itself. So I guess the initial question here is what makes my piano playing unique or identifiable to something like a neural network. And I think one of the first features that I think that it might pick up on is something that I, in my head, have always called fording. And basically, if I'm going to land on a note, I often flick the closest note below it in scale, so. It's not quite seeking which is what a lot of jazz players do. It's just sort of flirting. I also don't really resolve things all that much. People like Jacob Collier always talk about starting you at a point and taking you on a wild journey and then bringing you home, whereas I just leave you out in the desert. <laughs> Good luck finding an Uber out there. And then I also do this thing where I press on the accelerator and, and then brake, if that makes any sense probably doesn't. I too am a black box. Finally, I rarely play anything in B and I tend to gravitate to white keys more than black keys. And no, there's no underlying meaning to that. So seeing that I wanted my piano to play along with me, I started with something called AI Duet, which is a pretty basic RNN that essentially just does that. It plays along with you using the data that you had just fed it in its own short-term memory. The demo isn't quite as mind-blowing as the concept, but you still should play the demo if you haven't. You can play it in browser, you don't need to run anything locally. This is the basic version of AI Duet. I am blue and the AI is yellow. Steve Reiki rhythm, isn't it? So I needed AI Duet's short-term memory algorithm to be properly weighted with a longer-term memory algorithm of me playing for a few hours. I also needed to add a MIDI output to AI Duet so I could loop it back into itself and see if it evolved at all. Another great project to borrow code and or ideas from is OpenAI's MuseNet, which does a really good job at auto-completing songs or chord structures that you feed it. There are some magenta algorithms that try to do the same, but it seems like MuseNet is kind of king of that territory. So this is a basic GUI for OpenAI's MuseNet, and this is kind of like a tree structure. When MuseNet gets it right, it's really, really convincing. I'm gonna play a little version of a song called A Baptist Church in Georgia, which is kind of a simple piano song from one of my older albums. And I'm gonna put a little bit of variation on it and then let MuseNet finish it and see if it chooses what I would choose. Just for the purposes of not having to troubleshoot a bunch of stuff in case that it throws out a bunch of garbage at the end, I'm just going to keep my playing style simple and not use the sustain pedal or anything. So uh, here we go. And then we'll see where it goes from there. If I were to improvise the rest of this myself, I would probably go from that D to an E to a C. I'm not sure why it chose such a random direction after that, but this is definitely one that we're gonna to wanna to fine tune. So my half-assed bridge of AI Duet and MuseNet actually worked 
really well, except that for some reason the AI just always wanted to work its way up to the highest register of the piano, like the top four or five keys. And this obviously isn't ideal, but I wasn't using reinforcement learning in my RNN, so I had no idea how to go back and fix that. It's so funny because it understands so much about what I'm playing and what I'm feeding it, but it's just made up its mind that it needs to be playing way up in the higher register, and it doesn't know that that's just not right. It doesn't know that, like, no, playing those keys constantly is annoying. <laughs> To be fair, I suppose that the closest thing to singularity or machine consciousness would be free will and just ignoring what the human tells you to do. <laughs> so starting over from scratch with reinforcement learning, I could spend a little bit more time properly weighting the difference between the short-term and long-term memory of the hidden layer, meaning that I wanted the piano to play in my style, but I also wanted it to play in the same scale and key that I was currently playing at the time it would be contributing to what I was playing. That's my metronome. <laughs> Moment of truth. So what do you think? Did it pass the Turing test? I'm actually very happy with the way that it turned out. And I'm also very much looking forward to eating dinner somewhere that is not my desk. And as of a few minutes ago, 
I now can. If you like this video, subscribe to my channel. If there's anything you want me to cover in the future, let me know in the comments. If you will be at NAM this year, give me a high five. If you will not be at NAM this year, I will be doing a lot of streams from there live on location, so tune in. And of course, if you want access to unreleased music, ambisonic field recordings, audio assets, and an amazing Discord community with everything from game servers to monthly songwriting challenges, then my Patreon is for you, and you can join for as little as a dollar. All right, I'll see you soon. Bye.